stage over to Robin and Martha. Thank you for joining us today. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining this session. And um, today we will talk about um, creating and sharing course video on a limited budget. And we tried to mix it up a little bit from last year and um, things change, which is one of the topics or concepts we wanna make sure that you understand. So I just wanna introduce myself and then I'm gonna let my colleague Martha introduce herself. Uh, I am Robin Sullivan. If you need to find me at UB, look up in the directory under Roberta, but my um, contact information is there on the screen. Please, um, you know, make sure to uh, reach out if needed. And I am a teaching and learning strategist with the University at Buffalo Libraries. And Martha, if you could please introduce yourself as well. Sure, Robin, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Martha Gratrix and I'm a instructional designer at Empire State College focused mainly on uh, SUNY Online. Great, thanks Martha. Okay, so we did um, put a URL together so that you can access the slides. We have a lot of really great resources, including a number of uh, how-to videos and ex ex uh, other videos that Martha has created. Um, so we want to make sure you get the resources. I'm sure I shared them with Jamie as well, so they will be available through the SUNY websites. But the short URL, if you want them right away, is bit.ly slash SUNY dash otter dash video and Jamie your help in putting that into the chat or Martha or someone bitly uh, slash SUNY dash otter dash video so what we will talk about today is some uh, approaches and workflows for creating and sharing course video we want to start out a little bit with some words of wisdom um, make sure to connect with your campus support. They are a great resource and um, whether you have a small campus or a large campus, there's usually at least one or two people either in your IT or in your um, direct department or in your libraries who can assist you or who can help you, um, you know, even just review your videos to make sure that they are explaining what you want them to share. Um, also, your campus should be able to tell you what type of options are available to you that are enterprise supported. A lot of the tools that we may share may not have um, direct support from your campus, if that's the case. One of the concepts we are always in support of is to um, be sure that the tools that you're using are accessible and make sure the videos you create are accessible. We will talk about that at length. And um, if the option is something that your campus does not support, uh, make sure that you have some um, okay from them, but then also be sure to um, know how to find your own answers. There's always help on every platform and Google searching the error code or whatever it is that might be stumbling you. Make sure to know where to find those answers for yourself or communities that you can go and ask the questions that you might run into. Even if your campus does have certain options, you always do need that plan A, B, and C so that you are comfortable using the technology and when it does fail, you can say, oh, well, we're just gonna move to the next option. So Martha, can you take it from here? Or should yeah. I just start, you, you, tell me no, what no. I'm going to play. That's fine, Robin. Um, I wanted to kick things off with this video that I put together from the SUNY Online Summit student panel. It was a great panel discussion. Students spoke on many, many topics. But for the purpose of our presentation, I pulled together a few of the sound bites that related to their um, thoughts on instructor videos. So go ahead, Robin, and play the video. I think that it's really helpful when when professors are actively involved. Um, I like the videos. I have a, um, my 
um, statistics professor right now does videos that where she's you actually get to see her face and and she's got little anecdotes that you know make me giggle while I'm doing my work and and she's very involved and and it it just makes it a an easier process. I just feel like the videos are so helpful and I was surprised that not all professors use that strategy like I was kind of disappointed with that because I feel like especially as an online student um you know we don't have that visual support where the teacher's teaching you in front of a chalkboard you can ask questions you can you know so I just felt like videos are so helpful and they, they give you all the visual and the learning and I don't know I love the videos I wish I wish all the professors use videos like every module one of my um, psychology professors he does a recap on the module of just like touches bases on a few of the important things that we read from the book that you know he assigns like the chapters that he assigns and for me that's great because when he's explaining it i'm like okay that's how i understood when i was reading it so like i understand what that chapter was about so uh, a video of just like a quick recap of that lesson or even just a YouTube video of somebody else explaining um, part of that module would, would be helpful because like most people touched up on, we don't have one-on-one -on -one interactions. Oh, you get the sense that students uh, really enjoy videos in their courses from these particular students. And uh, while they do mention um, sort of content reviews and things like that, uh, we wanted to add just some bullets of some other ideas so that you don't feel limited that if you're thinking about adding video, you just need to add uh, course overview, uh, content overview types things. So demonstrations, tutorials, virtual field trips, I love the idea of guest expert interviews just to freshen things up and switch things out. Um, they would make for some very interesting additions and um, it really helps to increase instructor presence very quickly when you add videos. So when you share examples of things, analogies, personal experiences, it really, really can be powerful. Go ahead, Robin. So I wanted to introduce this I, um, this topic, not at all because we, we want we have the intention of covering it in in terms of what it's all about. We we wanted to bring it in here just because it's it's a current topic that's likely being discussed on your campus. Uh, it you know recently the Department of Education has changed and updated some guidelines and some key characteristics for regular and substantive interaction include that if they be instructor initiated, that they be fairly frequent. So no one-up things. Um, we bring this up because we think it ties in nicely with video. So we don't um, you know, talk about it in a minute. If you wanna make a highlight of the best of forum posts, just don't do it once if you're trying to accomplish this goal because part of it is regular and fairly frequent. And the third one um, about the interaction is simply that it be meaningful and related to course concepts. So we thought about a few ideas that we could bring up to um, fit this category. Uh, they had to do with video. And the first one is after a discussion ends, creating a short video that highlights some of the best um, pieces, the best points that people brought up, the relevant things that pertain to content, things like that. Um, really just giving some closure to a discussion. The second one is to elaborate on an assignment rubric. Now this doesn't have to be limited obviously to talking about a rubric. You could just create a short video that really goes into more depth about an assignment, giving examples and things like that, just offering more guidance. There's sometimes students are anxious about assignments. So to hear from you in this way might be a very, very nice touch. And the third one, um, sometimes you take a quiz and you get your grade and you see what you got wrong and it just maybe falls right there. So the third idea revolves around this idea of making short videos that go over kind of the, the questions that seem to give many students a little trouble. 
uh, um, there's a, I forgot the name of the feature in Blackboard, but you can you can see which questions um, the data on the questions that most students got wrong. So basically, um, these are just some ideas that you could implement on a regular basis that um, would kind of help bolster this this regular and substantive interaction in your course. Now, I, I want to point out too. This is a quick way to give feedback to the whole class. So that's another uh, really nice thing about video, posting a video, it goes out to everyone. And does it pertain to everyone if you're going over some questions people got wrong? No, not necessarily. But um, it's still, you know, we thought these were decent ideas to get the, that ball rolling. Um, and now the next slide relates to um, personalized feedback. And we've included a link to T for Teaching podcast that um, Jessica Kruger did on giving video feedback to her students. Um, and I wanna say, I emailed back and forth with Jessica the other day talking about this topic. Uh, you know, and I'm very interested to know what people who are with us today think about this, whether they use it, whether their students like it, um, et cetera, because it's, it's interesting. Um, Jessica really said that, that it's effective for her because she sets the groundwork prior to providing video feedback by creating an environment of constant improvement. Students are revising their papers multiple times. So she said her students love it and that they also like some written thing on their papers as well so they can see exactly where they need to make changes. And she suggested maybe a combo approach would be ideal. Great. And and I do notice in the um, chat, she had, um, Paula, I, I noticed in the chat that Paula has mentioned that she also provides feedback using video. And so Paula, I think um, I would love at the end, if um, I'm going to, we will try to leave some extra time. We would love to hear some specifics about how you do that. So it's great to see that some people are using that strategy. Yes. And the last thing I want to just throw in that Jessica said, because she is so great, um, she, she loves the support and connection that it gives between her and students. And that probably uh, is one of the main reasons that she wanted to explore it. And adapt it. So yeah, we are very interested. Who uses it? Is it working for you? And have you had feedback from students on this topic? Great. And, and um, Maureen, you also commented in the chat about the volume going low. I hope it has corrected itself. If not, please let us know in the chat if it's um, still a problem or if we should. Uh, maybe I need to just uh, quit looking to the side at my chat. Is that much better if I kind of stay focused here? Usually I'm on a much bigger machine with a different webcam. Okay, so I will I will focus. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the heads up on that. Um, okay, so the next item we want to talk about is um, be sure that you um, purposely incorporate diversity into any of the videos that you create. Um, you also want to consider is there a need to create the videos in alternative languages. Um, later on, Martha has created a how-to tutorial that will help you do just that. Um, and um, in addition, the, um, just recently I learned that the Google Nest and Alexa will now provide real-time translation. And so I was able to provide a workshop. Um, I would speak a sentence in English, my Google Nest, I'm not home right now, so I can, well, actually my mom has one here, um, but I could just say, please help me speak Spanish, and it would translate what I'm saying in real time in my, in, you know, in a very accurate process. But also on this screen, another resource you want to grab afterwards is um, 13 free resources for diverse stock photography. It's just so easy to, um, you know, if you don't meaningfully put effort into making sure that all um, demographics are represented, it's easy to um, skip over that very important topic. So, um, let's see, let's, uh, I just want to very briefly introduce the idea of screencasting. And what screencasting is, is just making a recording of what you see on the screen.
and many times that is very useful even um, you know you can just play your uh, PowerPoint or Google slide or if you have a spreadsheet that you're manipulating or software you can put that onto your computer screen use one of these screencasting tools and it will automatically uh, or not automatically using these screencasting tools you can capture video of that process um, two that we will highlight um, or that we will mention are Screencast-O-Matic and Camtasia and um, the feature for today is going to be Loom which is one of the new tools that are available and this video we are not going to play um, some you will have to just go back into the slides and play them for yourselves this is a video that shows you how to use Screencast-O-Matic Keep in mind that features often do change, um, but I think this, you know, sometimes you just have to uh, extrapolate, you know, the button used to say save and now it says save as or something like that. And then Martha's going to talk about this one or introduce this one and then I will play it. Yeah, um, last year I, I made this Screencast-O-Matic video because I was a long standing fan of Screencast-O-Matic. Um, but, you know, it was free and that's huge, right? When something's free and the limitations to me didn't seem too great. So um, this year I decided to take a look at Loom and I made another short video. It's not really a how-to, it's more of a quick little tour of Loom. And I, I really liked it. So it's another it's another option that you would have. Uh, so you can go ahead and this play year that. I featured Screencast-O-Matic for this presentation. And this year I took a look at Loom. I'm using a teleprompter, by the way, it's called QPrompter. It opens in a browser and it's very easy to use. You wouldn't need to write out a whole script in order to make use of this tool. You could put an outline up there of things you plan to talk about just to stay on track and not go off on a tangent, which is so easy to do. I did try to record this presentation freestyle and I said, um, so many times that I decided to do it over with the teleprompter. And I'll mention that again in a bit. I visited the Loom site and signed up for a free account. The tool is free if you're using it for education. So sign up with your work email and you'll be all set. You'll get a choice between using Loom in an app or as a Chrome extension. And I chose the app. Once you're in the Loom environment, it will feel very familiar if you've ever used a screen capture program before. There is an option right below your headshot to toggle between your live camera feed and an image of yourself, providing you yeah. upload one. I wasn't done, Robin. Oh, wasn't done? Nope. All right. How far along were we? And leave comments turned on. You can ask know. Go back. examples. Other things to know. There's missing issues and outside stuff. References. These are just a list of things you can look over and think about and decide whether you want to turn them on or leave them off. One option is to allow comments. If you host and share your video on the Loom platform and leave comments turned on, you could ask your students to give examples, ask questions, or share resources related to the content you provided. Call to action allows you to provide a link via a button that you can locate anywhere on the screen. For example, you could ask students to take a survey after they are done watching your video. You'd provide the link right there on the screen. Loom is a nice tool, easy to navigate and easy to get to know. I encourage you to try it out, experiment with some of its features, and make use of the delete filler words tool if you need to. And Robin, I think that's the thing that went missing in the in the video. I was, you know, looking around at what the tool had to offer, and I found um, this, this tool. It it gives you a transcript, and it includes punctuation. I was really impressed by that. And you can quote delete filler words. So if you say um a lot like I do, um, you you can get, <laughs> you can get rid of um from not only the transcript but from the audio. So that was kind of a, kind of a, a cool little piece. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add was um, the education account is free and it includes unlimited video, 45 minutes of recording time, HD video, a drawing tool, 
mouse emphasis. I'm not positive what, what that is. I think that's that little yellow circle that goes around. And custom recording dimensions and the call for action button. So I thought that was pretty great. Yeah, and actually late last night as I was playing around again, um, I discovered that I created my Loom using my Gmail account instead of my um, my uh, EDU account. And so I'm not getting at the advantage of those education features, so I'm going to have to change my account over. So thanks, Martha, for bringing that to my attention. Okay, so um, I'm just going to briefly introduce um, recording using your smartphone or your tablet. So these devices now are very much uh, ubiquitous. Many people have them available. Many of your students have them available. And so recording video using a smartphone or using an iPad or a tablet, these are really great options. And you know, in Hollywood, they are using these devices as well. When the pandemic first hit, I was just blown away on you know how many of the, the news recordings and um, you know the NFL draft and everything else, people were using these devices to produce broadcast quality video. So don't discount them. They are great cameras. Um, use your stylus to allow handwritten notes and notation on the videos. Certain um, software will allow you to do that. But when possible, try to use a tripod or be creative. You know, use right now my my lap my laptop is on a box of Kleenex just so that I'm not you're not looking up my nose. Um, <laughs> but be creative. Um, you know, we're going to show you a, or talk about a video later where you can use duct tape to uh, just duct tape your phone to a window so you get that beautiful natural light. You don't want too much of it, so you don't want a really sunny window with a really sunny light. But um, you know, be creative. This article that is linked to has some great tips on how to use. Uh, your smartphone to create video. Yeah, okay, so I did make a short video. It's mine's on the left, it's 324, and it, and it talks about recording using your smartphone. I do wanna say, um, I don't like reinventing wheels that are out in the world, and there's some great resources already on this topic. I found one that I really liked, it's 11 minutes long, um, was done by a person at RIT who I use in my video and call her out as making a great video. But anyway, this one just kind of does what Robin just said. And, and it also explains how to use your phone to record presentations. So you could play that one. That's a new one. Okay. So you think you need a new laptop, software, and microphone to create content? Well, not a Give me just one second. I'm just going to navigate out to YouTube. I'm not sure why the first one en enlarged. Uh, so I'm not gonna... if you have a smartphone. How's that? You can record a presentation yourself and anything within your view with your phone. I found a couple of videos that Clara Riedlinger from RIT created. She did a great job explaining the details of how to create good course recordings with your smartphone. She emphasized ideas that should be emphasized, such as be yourself set a positive tone and think of video as a way to build rapport with learners my absolute favorite thing she mentioned was keep things short aim for six minutes and try to cover one concept per video while this might seem unnatural if you are used to giving a long lecture you will find that this approach is a great fit in the online environment use books or a phone tripod to get your phone to eye level pick a well-lit spot Diffuse light is what you are after, so don't sit or stand in a shadow. See that there is enough light on your face. Another thing Clara mentioned is that people have a higher tolerance for low quality video than they do for low quality audio. Pay attention to whether or not there is ambient noise like air conditioning or traffic. And if there is, find a different place or a different time to record. Another point Clara made that I didn't realize was use your back facing camera on your phone. It will record better quality. Practice, 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 and try to relax knowing that you can do multiple takes. After you stop recording, you need to move the file from your phone to a cloud storage service. Like Clara, I like Google Drive. Upload from your phone to the cloud We lost audio. Oh. You need to. 
I'm sorry, there's do, doing some construction, so I was trying to avoid to that. Or your Canvas oh. streaming server. Use your phone to screen record. I'm using my iPhone to record a presentation that I have ready to go in Google Slides. The same can be done using an Android, but steps may vary. First of all, you want to have your screen recording controls right at your fingertips. In order to do that, go to Settings and click Control Center. There's a list under More Controls, so look down that list until you see Screen Recording. And when you do, click the plus sign. After you click the plus sign, Screen Recording will move up into your Quick Access area. To begin, I swiped up, pressed the Screen Record button, and saw a countdown begin. Then I swiped down to get my control center off the screen and I opened my presentation. So you can see the title page, Open Educational Resources. Talk your way. Just want to see if I can get that volume up. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Christy, for the note. Way through your presentation and when you are done, look for the red bar at the top and touch it. When you do, you will see a pop-up asking you if you would like to stop recording. Press stop. Your recording will be saved to photos. Upload it to your cloud service of choice, then download it, trim as needed, and then it's ready to upload to a media streaming server. Great, thanks. Apologize about the couple audio hiccups we're having here. Okay, and yeah, those resources are part of our presentation. We have the links going out to YouTube. So if anybody is interested in watching uh, either Clara's from RIT, you can get to it from our presentation. Uh, hers is more detailed and it focuses more on just doing the recordings of yourself. Uh, so lighting and audio, all the things we've been touching on. Okay, so I'm going to talk just a little bit more about that uh, being creative by getting that tripod going. And um, again, I'm not home today, but I would share with you two of the really fun tools that I bought for myself. One of them on the left is a, a tripod for my phone. Actually, it's a holder, so I can use that for shooting. Um, it tilts. It works really great for kind of serving as a document camera. So I can just tilt my phone a little bit more and have it point to myself writing on a piece of paper or pointing to an object or a book. And so um, it works really good in Zoom. You just um, <clears throat> have the settings to either connect, um, I believe, through your Wi-Fi or also through a cable that you connect from your computer to your phone, or I'm sure many other um, software have that ability. The other item in the um, top right is a gooseneck tripod. And so that one clips onto the side of the table and then holds your phone in a little claw grip. And again, you can see that it uses it um, kind of as a document camera or you can just point it at the exact height or level that you want it to be. Um, I really like both of them and they're about 10 bucks. Um, I will be um, talking to our libraries at the University of Buffalo and um, asking them to add it to our loaner stock of tripods and accessories that we have um, for people. So the um, link, I should link the cell phone stand as well to the one I bought. I'm pretty happy with them. Uh, thank you to the colleagues who have introduced it to me. Um, and uh, yes, this, uh, Susan, the gooseneck tripod would be great for students who need to show their math um, or some other type of work to sharing that back to the class. And asking a student to buy a $10 item um, is not a, a big request. Give them choices so that if they are not able to do that, then they might, um, you know, scan their work or take a f picture of it and upload it. But, um, you know, it certainly is an option. Now, um, let's see, Martha, I think you were going to talk about uh, VEED, yes. Yeah, uh, VEED. So uh, a couple times when I'm making these things, I use how to work with video, I say, oh, then just you can edit your MP, MOV or <laughs> MP4 file. And editing, um, this is just my opinion, I, I think it's hard to find a free editing tool um, that does a great job. If anybody uses one, please, please speak up about it. I tried a few and I didn't like any of them. And then I looked at feed and I thought, Honestly, for most people, you want to trim your video, maybe take out a little section in the center that you flubbed and then patch those together and so forth. So when I open feed, I just 
um, added a video that I made and I had just made a video in Loom. So I brought that in, trimmed, trimmed it, took out a middle section where I said, um, a million times. Then it let me bring in another video from Loom that I could stitch together next to it. I trimmed that up and uh, let me download the, the whole thing put together as an MP4. So I was happy. Um, obviously, if you want to do a lot more, um, you probably want to move over into some, some things that you pay for. Um, you know, there's probably some inexpensive ones, but again, I'm not an expert on that world because for 20 years I've been using the same editing program and it's not a real popular one. Um, it's called Vegas and, um, you know, it's just what I know. So I stay with it because it's, it takes a while to learn how to get, um, very proficient in video editing. Great. So um, there's other options to create video, some that you may be more familiar with. Um, PowerPoint. If you just put your slides together, you can um, add audio notation and save that out as a video file. Um, you can do this uh, something similar with Google Slides. You can open up those slides and then record the screen. Um, and if you are comfortable with those environments, then find something that you're comfortable with. And also, if your campus is a Google campus or your campus is a Microsoft campus, then you also have that wonderful added benefit of campus support. Um, in addition, as we are creating the video right here using web meeting tools such as Zoom, don't discount that for just using it to create video. You don't have to be talking to somebody to hit that record button. You can just open up that software. And the thing is, you got to make sure that you see that little record link um, that says we are recording. Yep, I see it on the screen here. <laughs> um, it's, it's so easy to, you know, open up Zoom and think you're recording. And if you didn't hit that record button, you can go minutes or an hour and say, oh, darn, I forgot to hit record. So that's the one drawback of trying to use these web conferencing tools to create video. But otherwise, they do really good. And um, again, when uh, the pandemic first hit, I saw Zoom being used by many professionals to create video. And um, Mike Wesh, Michael Wesh is one of my favorites as far as um, watching some of the videos that he's created about creating videos and about teaching online. And we wanted to just um, share a couple examples. You can watch these a little bit later. One of them's a short 10 minute. If that's all you wanna spend. The other one has got a great one hour playlist. Really great tips. He's really engaging. And just watching him create these videos, you kind of get the idea of you have to be an engaging speaker when you're creating these videos. If you're monotone and just kind of talking, you know, people are going to tune out. So you have to have excitement just like in a classroom so that that excitement is contagious to your learners. So we want to just take a little bit of a break. We went through a lot and um, we want to take a break and ask if there are so some questions. I think we tried to address them as we've gone forward. I keep trying to not look away, but hopefully my sound is okay. Have I missed any questions or are there any questions somebody would like to unmute and ask or put into the chat? We have more to share. We just wanted to take a break in here. I see some people did um, contribute ideas for easy video editor and it's k-a-p-w-i-n-g that's not one i found what's the name of that one uh, k-a-p-w-i-n-g okay new one on me as well we will also share a list of tools with you and i don't think that one is on my list so i will try to make sure to add it um we'll talk about that in a minute Paul, yeah, iMovie i should have talked about iMovie because that is a favorite that's an absolute favorite. Mm -hmm. And the $5 for the app. So that's, that's absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm just um, looking through here for suggestions. Great. And um, I think Paula's got a great suggestion there also. Um, if you have um, multiple people on the call, it's great to, if you're using Zoom to capture or a web conferencing tool, to pin and, and spotlight the main speakers so that they will stay in focus um, as compared to if uh, you don't do that and someone else um, ruffles their paper, then they might be focused even though they're not speaking. 
um, that's also great. Um, I think we learned the doing during the SUNY online summit that it's great to um, only have the people that you want to show have their video going and you can go into your settings in Zoom and say only show people who have their video feed on. So we got a lot to share so I'm going to push forward since many did you know we don't have any questions that came up and it'll just leave us more time at the end for more questions and conversation hopefully. Um, Martha, yeah. can you talk about hosting? Oh, sure. Um, so I'm here to assume anything, but most times you think people are aware that if it's a video, if you're working with video, it needs its destination needs to be a streaming server. Um, I looked around on the internet to see like a good analogy for, for you know, that strikes to the heart of why. And I, I liked the, the one that I found. It's, um, the analogy of streaming water from a tap as opposed to filling a glass of water and then walking it over and handing it to someone. So it's a continuous, uninterrupted thing that you can deliver to students. And, and in the presentation right before ours, uh, we, the gentleman who I, the name escapes me was talking about internet connect, connectivity and how important that is. So um, this pertains to this because when you don't put your video on a streaming server, it requires that it be downloaded. And with, for people with you know, internet connections that are not robust, that requires quite a bit of time. And not to say that there are no problems with streaming, of course there are if you have limited internet. And that just you know, goes back to this idea that um, putting content out there in multiple ways, meaning with the transcript, the video, you know, so that students can get the information from you in different ways is always ideal. Uh, anyways, the, the ones that most of us are familiar with and around SUNY anyway, uh, Panopto, Kaltura, and Ensemble. And really, some of them, you pay a little more, you get the captioning. Some don't come with captioning. It's, it's just a mixed bag out there in terms of pricing and what your campus has decided to do. Uh, the all-time best-known video streaming ever is probably YouTube. So I've been on YouTube a long time. I really like YouTube. I have a little video later that talks about, we're not going to play it because you can get that information quickly any, any way you want to or any, on the internet about how to work with changing your auto captions to, um, you know, captions that are perfect done by you. So that's... Did I miss anything, Robin? Um, I just want to add that um, YouTube also has tremendous reach. So if you want to create the videos and you desire to share them beyond your classroom, YouTube would be the recommendation from me on where you would want to host that video as compared to maybe um, the campus Panopto server. Um, YouTube is the second most popular search engine, second only to Google. And um, so it, if that is a desire, you can put your videos up on YouTube, but you can also granular, granularly um, restrict access. So if you only want to have people have access if you give them the link, or um, you can restrict it in other ways as well. So I think that's kind of an important topic too. So we uh, mentioned towards the beginning, do not um, downplay the importance of captioning and transcripts. This is a universal design principle that you definitely need to keep in mind as you're creating videos. We've mentioned a few tools that will allow you to um, uh, allow you to caption and automatically provide a transcript. Um, YouTube does this very well, and the video that Martha created gave gives that will show on the next screen gives some good advice about how to do that. Um, the um, auto captioning is not 100% perfect, but it's getting much closer than it used to be. Um, before you would have a lot of really hilarious um, misinterpretations, now you have some, and you can go in and edit those to make sure that they are accurate. Um, there are some tools that now give you live subtitles. We are very lucky that um, we have that feature in Zoom. 
Um, Otter AI is another live subtitling tool that's freely available up to about 40 minutes, I think. And Web Captioner is another free live uh, tr you know, captioning tool that can be used with, with anything. Um, in addition, Martha mentioned that Loom provides a punctuated transcript. That punctuation is really important. And also the removal of the word um and us, which I am very guilty of. Uh, uh, I was happy to see Loom do that for us. Here's the video that Martha created about auto captions and yeah, adding I, languages. And I just wanted to talk about one quick thing and that's just how quickly things change. So I did the same thing last year. I had this video that walked people through editing auto captions. And when I opened up to do something a little while ago, I thought, oh gosh, the environment looks different. It's nicer, in my opinion, easier. Um, and so everything changes with technology. And just a little spin off from that thought, we are talking about creating course videos. And I was thinking earlier how, if you have something, some content, you know it's gonna change. You know it's gonna change possibly in the near future don't invest too much time and energy into getting that down like do some quick and dirty video because it's going to change now for things that are not going to change that's where you want to invest as you know as much creativity and care as you can because that video can live on through semester after semester great and i do want to address a few comments in the chat maureen thank you for pointing out that google drive now allows the videos to play back as a stream i happen to notice that i think just this morning i didn't notice it on a written page i noticed it when i clicked on a video inside of my drive and it started playing right away as compared to waiting uh 30 seconds or so for it to load and then play um, our, at our campus, we have uh, the box drive, and some people use that for video, but it does not stream as compared to what a streaming server does, and that, and I guess now that Google Drive does. Um, our box um, setup, from what I know, does not stream. So if you do put videos in there because you have more ability to restrict who watches them, um, just keep in mind that there might be a slight delay in the starting of those videos. Um, there was also, um, Diane, it's great to hear that you require your students to do captioning as well. Um, oops, um, the, this screen right here, I thought, um, Jamie, I thought that this was our most popular SUNY workshop, but you were, we'll have to, you know, check the settings between the creating captions on a shoestring budget or creating videos on a shoestring budget. Those were the two items we did last time, but this is um, a recording from before and it's still, you know, pr very worthwhile. If you are going to be using captions or if you're going to have your students do captions, please refer to this video um, and share the video with your students as well. It's on YouTube. Um, so we also wanted to share that um, there is a resource that is available to everybody on the internet that is sponsored from SUNY. It is the Exploring Emerging Technologies for Lifelong Learning and Success. For short, we call it MTech MOOC. And in addition to the MOOC, there is a complimentary wiki. On that wiki, there are um, a variety of video recording tools. 98% of everything that's on the wiki are freely available tools. Um, so you can filter them down. I'm actually gonna open that up real quick. You can filter down the tools um, so you can actually go here and um, just search directly through the wiki. You don't have to bother with the MOOC if that's not what you're looking for. But here there are um, about, I think, over 500 tools and resources and tutorials. And if I wanted to limit to video, I can just go to the category menu and I can just say, show me the, the items that relate to video. Um, if I want to search by uh, an objective, I can search by the 21st century skills, and um, if I want to um, say that I wish to create new knowledge, I can do that. Hit Film Express, um, actually I think I just went past that one. That's a great tool. Um, in addition, there are, um, you, know, you can just do a search for captions, 
and they will come up as well that resource that was shared earlier in the chat somebody's going to have to make sure that i get that information so that it can be added or just go directly to the wiki and contribute that yourself anybody in the world can add a tool um, you just go in create an account and then you um, add that tool. It's a very quick process. I have about a list of a thousand things that I still have been collecting and adding um, that we need to be categorized. So please help me out. If there's something that we haven't on, don't have on this wiki, um, you know, please add it as well. So let's see. And I wonder if, uh, I think it was Paula could unmute and just talk about quickly your experience with video feedback. I'm particularly interested in that topic. Sure. Um, last semester, spring semester was my first semester teaching as an adjunct at New Paul. And I'm always looking for the quick and easy. <laughs> and for me, um, talking to people just helps me understand. So I figured rather than spending hours marking up papers, I use the screen capture. I put their papers up on the screen, and as I was reading through it, I commented on areas and offered suggestions. Made videos about two minutes, three minutes long per student, sent it off to them for each assignment, and they loved it. It worked well for all of us. A positive response for the most part. And what's your workflow? Do you use a campus provided um, capture? You know, what I just curious to know how we you. We were using Nomia, but I understand Nomia is going away. So I'm not sure what they're going to use, but I have iMovie and a variety yeah. of other tools yeah. to play with. Thank you, Paula, very much. And Paula is also one of the uh, graduates of the MTech MOOC. And so um, uh, since we have you unmuted, Paula, can I ask you to just talk for a second to um, explain what the wiki um, provides and maybe your ex experience in the MOOC as far as helping you understand how to use technologies to engage your students? Sure. The so, wiki, you're able to access different areas communication, collaboration, critical thinking. Um, and they have hundreds of resources that are on there. So the filters enable you to go in and to narrow down your searches. Uh, I chose to do the ePortfolio as part of the work on this MOOC. And it, it was just great for me. It focused on lifelong learning and I have definitely grasped a lot as a result of it. So it was good. I Great. enjoyed it. Thank you, Paula. Um, this screen right here just has some direct links. So if you want to uh, directly go to the video resources, you can click the link on this slide. Or if you're interested in making your videos accessible, click on that third link there. We added that essential tools category because a lot of people, if they would go to the wiki and they'd say, oh, 500 different choices, too many. So you can immediately go to essential tools and it will show you the very most um, popular type of tools that people are using. Um, so if the big collection's too much for you, start out small. Um, and also, um, at the very beginning of this workshop, we shared um, how to find uh, images that, are, that reflect diversity. And that is on the wiki under the photos and images section. But it also under photos and images, you can find many places where you can find photos and images to integrate within your videos to help explain concepts. You can also find um, B-roll video footage that is there are freely available and able to be used legally. Um, everybody knows that, you know, on the internet, you can just right click on pretty much any image, but that doesn't mean you're legally or um, ethically able to use that image. The MTech explains what it means to find a Creative Commons image and how to find an image that you are legally and 
ethically able to use. So that is, I think, all of our slides. Um, we did want to leave. I'm glad finally for once, I think we got, a, we have a few minutes at the end here. I would love to open up to conversation. I enjoyed reading the comments in the chat. We may have missed one or two comments um, that um, have gone through. So please bring those back to our attention, but we would like to open it up and you know, any questions, any um, comments that people have, any sharing what are you using what's working well for you what have you tried what didn't work well for you please now's our time to have a conversation unmute or raise your hand Jamie if you can help us uh, you know pay attention if there's somebody that has their hand raised or feel free to just put some comments into the chat I do have a question about the um, teleprompter you mentioned, can you show it or? Sure, and Martha, um, I think I'm gonna, the, the, the teleprompter that you had talked about was Q, is that what it's called? Oh yeah, uh, Q prompter, yeah. Q prompter. Yeah, it's just, it's just a browser based thing. You could just Google Q prompter, open it up. I just needed it. I'm not an instructor, I'm, you know, staff, I don't, get in front of the camera very often and occasionally I have to and I I become somewhat discombobulated. So I like you Q, Q prompter because it it kept me on track. And I you don't have to write out every word that you're gonna say. I usually just put a little outline up there. And I put the browser right next to my camera so that you know I'm not looking over here or whatever. And it, it works well for me. Uh, again, like all things, you just gotta practice practice it'll get better and better and you'll feel more at ease and there you go there's two points. this this is the start button um that you want to use and i think if i had more uh yeah you can you can reduce the font size you can set up your pace the way you like it it's, i don't know it's, i just i needed help i was saying um constantly and forgetting where i was going next and when i make videos i really really try to make them short and when you are rambling on and changing topics and, and you're like, I was like a runaway train. So this really helped me, <laughs> it helped me a lot to stay on track and keep a, keep my uh, video short. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And you saw how easy it was. I had never opened up Q prompter before. Um, and so, you know, you just go there. These green start buttons, you want to avoid clicking on them. I did click on it, but there's usually another tool. You know, these are often lead you towards advertising. There is often another more um, less in your face kind of button, um, which is the one that I hit to actually start it. Um, but I do want to mention that um, uh, pay attention to any of these freely available tools. Pay attention. Um, you may have to do some legwork to find out, are they fully accessible? Are they um, valuing the security and privacy aspects? We, the MTech team is on a mission to try to evaluate all of the resources that are on our site to be sure about that. And that's one of the reasons why campuses are often shying away from recommending these tools. But you can also ask a campus, many of them do not have a teleprompting software that's available for you to use. Many may not have a software that will allow you to annotate um, onto video. So you do need to be creative in, on many occasions to achieve the goal that you are trying to achieve. So just do due diligence on what it is that, um, you know, what is your objective? What are you trying to do? Um, other questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question. Wonderful. Um, I've been it. following this entire week, which was excellent. And um, I work in institutional research, but I need to put together a business analytics course. And um, I know that I have to talk to my Blackboard tech, um, but Blackboard, since I have a daughter who's a student here, is not really, going the way she wishes. Uh, I need someone who has somewhere in SUNY made state-of-the-art asynchronous courses 
and has put together so I don't have to go hunting through the MTech world to find, oh, there's um, 20 things I should look at. I'd rather find a mentor who says, look, I've done this and here is what I recommend. I'll be your mentor. It might be someone in the MTech world, um, might be someone that uh, Jamie Heron could uh, you know, recommend that, yeah, you, know, you want to talk to this person, use them to you know, guide you. So what have you got like a nice package that someone can use to make things happen? Um, so uh, yeah, Diane put a great uh, comment into the chat, the SUNY Community Mentor Program that um, maybe Aaron, Aaron Manny is leading. Is that the one you're referring to, Diane? And, and also Benjamin, I think we might also um, your campus um, do you have instructional designers or instructional support that is at your campus or your librarians often will be able to, you know, kind of guide you? Um, and a, thank you, Jamie, for sharing Erin's email address in the chat. Benjamin, I would recommend reaching out to her. Okay. Um, in addition, the principle behind the MTech community, um, it was developed to try to um, provide instructional support at scale. Um, I was uh, one of the, I was the only centrally available instructional designer at the University of Buffalo for many years. And UB, we have 30,000 students, so that's a big number of faculty. And so MTech was created to help faculty learn from each other. Um, and you can join the uh, MOOC and then you would be able to ask questions through the discussion forums and also through the Facebook group that we have established and through Twitter. And the research that we've done on an earlier project that MTech was modeled after shows that the biggest value people have received from their participation is by just watching and learning from what other people are learning. So you can go in and you can look at other people's portfolios. Many are right on that MTech website. You don't have to join the MOOC if that's not what you wish to do. Um, but you can go to the portfolio gallery under the impact menu. And you can just look and kind of review what other people have done and how they have approached it. But it's not that custom uh, you know, mentor, like you're asking for. Does anyone, and, and actually Maureen Larson suggested contacting Alex Pickett. Um, and if somebody can maybe put Alex's e email into the chat for Benjamin, that would be w wonderful as well. How are we doing on time? Uh, we're just about at the end. Maybe if there's one more, thank you, uh, Jamie, for um, helping us out there. Is there one more quick question or comment that we can address before we call it I another have, day? I have, I have a comment. I just, okay. I just want to say, um, a lot of times people have grandiose plans and they worry about implementing them. Uh, start small. Start with some simplistic things that you know you can improve upon. And I can't emphasize enough, keep your video short. Maybe it will be a talking head or a PowerPoint and later you'll add some great graphics in. Um, but, but start small because I think that's just, then you, you go easy on yourself, you have a little fun and then it, it just flows from there. Yes, and I see Jamie is fully agreeing with you in the chat. Um, I do want to specify that we have the uh, link on the screen so that you can find the recordings for this session and other sessions. Um, Jamie mentioned that we presented, uh, actually a couple of people on the call today presented about MTech. They are some of our MTech fellows. Um, Chris Marchese and uh, Nicole Simon presented on Tuesday at 2. So you can go back and watch that recording if you want to learn more about that. Or if you want to share this recording with colleagues, there's the URL, suny.edu slash otter. And I'm going to reuse one of our puns. So Martha and I are out of here. Go ahead. That's it. Jamie Thank Elders. you, Martha. Thank you, Rob. Thank and you, as you. ever, it was so helpful. We learned so many new uh, about so many new resources and, and ways to create uh, low budget but high impact uh, recordings for videos for our classes. So thank you again. Uh, we really appreciate it. I'm going to stop the recording now.